and welcome. I'm so excited that we are here today for seven strategic decisions for an effective leadership development program. Uh, my name is Anissa Avon, and I am the CEO of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. We are a full service employee development and learning solutions provider and consultancy firm. We have expert coaches, trainers. We are looking forward to introducing our expert today. But before I do that, I want to take care of just a little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, one, I want to say thank you to the Whitmore School. Uh, Whitmarsh Consulting Group. Um, if you are familiar with the Whitmarsh Consulting Group, they are sponsoring our webinar today. Uh, they are a group of distinctly skilled experts who specialize in creating revenue streams through digital marketing, um, and they are particularly savvy when it comes to the human resources and employee development space. Uh, so if you uh, or your organization would benefit from expanding your digital footprint or strategy, do check them out at wcg-bp.com. That's as in best practices. So wcg-bp.com. Um, now, just one other thing. This webinar is for you guys that are on the call. If we're not addressing your unique challenges and questions, then we have not done our job. So do let me know if there is uh, a particular outcome that you want to see happen during this conversation. Um, you have the ability to chat with us in the question box. So feel free to tell us if we're going too fast or if we skipped over something important. Um, feel free to uh, ping us on that question box and I'll do my best to monitor that and interject so that we can make this relevant um, for those of you who are spending your time with us. So I want to introduce you now to Renee Brockman. Uh, Renee is, uh, works with Turnkey as one of our executive coaches and organizational development consultants. And she has so much knowledge from actual work experience around leadership development, but even more than that on our topic today, on developing a pipeline of ready now leaders as a part of a greater um, succession planning strategy. She understands the ins and outs of that. She understands what works and what doesn't. And she has earned her stripes in more most ways than one. As you can see here, um, Renee uh, uh, got her BA in business management. I'm assuming that's because she decided dental hygiene, being a dental <laughs> hygienist wasn't in your cards, Renee. Exactly. Uh, she went on to get her master's in human resource development. And then one of the reasons that I invited her to speak today is, like I said, because of her deep well of experience. She has such a diverse background in OD and leadership coaching and classroom training, but she also has extensive knowledge from working in human resources in both the public and private sectors. She served as a former government director, and I said to her one day, I said, you know, I think if you can create an effective leadership pipeline strategy in, in a governmental uh, uh, position, then I think we could do that. You have unique knowledge that would serve uh, our clients in all in industries. And so that's why I'm excited to introduce you to Renee. Renee, what did I leave out? Did I leave out anything that you'd like for folks to know today about what makes you the expert and, and what we're going to learn today? Wow, you've, co you've covered so much. I'm almost impressed, or my mother would be at <laughs> least uh, uh, impressed. I think it's enough about me, and uh, let's just get on to the topic at hand. So I appreciate Perfect. the introduction very much. Okay, shall Beautiful. we get started? Beautiful. All right, we are ready to get started. So I'll, one of the I'll things wait. that we're going to talk about today, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Renee, is all of the different components and decisions. All is, is, a bitty, is a big word, but we're going to focus on the seven specific strategic decisions that help organizations design a, an effective leadership development program. And what you're looking at here, um, we'll provide to you guys after uh, the webinar if you believe it would be helpful. But you're going to want to come up with what components 
are essential for an effective leadership readiness program? What are the objectives? How will we know that we are successful? What's our guiding principles? How exactly is this going to support our current strategic goals as well as our future uh, of the organization? How do we sustain and, and have a legacy long after our boomers or executives retire? And then how do we design this to be a, a good fit for our culture? Not every component that we're going to talk about today is going to be a good fit for your culture. Not every leadership development program has to have a massive budget, although we have clients who have a very generous budget. We also have clients that um, are pulling things together using both internal and external resources and, and creating some pretty significant and impressive success. So go ahead and move to the next slide for us, Renee. Okay. I just want and to back up. telling us, what are we going to learn? There we yeah. go. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start with this slide. First of all, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I am so passionate about leadership development. I see the opportunities uh, almost everywhere, not only in organizations, you know, in business settings, but in uh, community uh, settings. How do we how do we all become better leaders, and what are we going to do about it? So thanks again for joining us. This slide that you see in front of us is probably my favorite slide in that this is such a good example of a complete one page document to use when you're when you're talking with your approving officials in your organization if you can talk about each of these uh, main headings from purpose objectives guiding principles components etc then you know that you have a, a, a fairly uh, complete program so like I said favorite um, it's really almost like a good checklist but let's get started and talking about filling the leadership gaps well why you know we, we identify you know we need to identify and develop highly skilled non managers interested in assuming leadership opportunities uh, you know boomers there there are old, older Americans are retiring in droves I know that's not news to most of us, but the exodus of the baby boomers from the workforce is just continuing. The labor force participation rate for boomers tanked a full percentage point down to 23.6% in the final quarter of, of last year. And this is all according to Bloomberg. In 2011, began the oldest members of the baby boom generation celebrated their 65th birthday. In fact, on that day, today, and for every day for the next 19 years, 10,000, 10,000 baby boomers will reach age 65. And again, this is from the Pew Research Center, if you're interested in those statistics. So the other half of that, you know, if we're talking about uh, boomers, of course, are the millennials. And by 2025, which really is around the corner, three out of four workers globally will be millennials. And according to statistics, again, the average tenure is two years compared to five years for the Gen X and seven years for boomers. 56% will not accept jobs from companies that ban social media. Hmm, who knew that? Okay, so we've really got to be focusing on the younger individuals, our contributors, and they're getting impatient for advancement. And so we balance that with the uh, boomers that are leaving in droves. So let's start with uh, this poll, Anissa. You want to take care of that? I sure will. So folks, we're going to launch this poll. How would you rate your organization's readiness? Uh, and we just want to get a, a, a some, some input from you guys on the call. Where are you with your leadership readiness program? Do you have an effective leadership development program in place and you're um, very proud of what you guys have done? Do you have um, – I find a lot of organizations uh, have are what we consider intermittent efforts. Um, some have a plan but have not really launched yet or launched at all. Some have no formal process for developing um, their leadership pipeline. And then, and, and perhaps there's, you fall into the other category. Let us know uh, your status. So, so far, Renee, um, about half of the folks on the call are saying that they really don't have a formal process for developing their leadership pipeline. 
Um, and then the, the largest percentage after that, it looks like we slowed down. So I'm going to close this out. You guys will be able to see it. Wow. There, there it is. Okay, uh, interesting, interesting. So of those 44%, hopefully you're in the right spot today and we can help get you started. And those of you that are at the intermittent effort, hopefully you have something maybe you can share with the rest of us or there's a tidbit or takeaway from today that will help you uh, move your program along. Um, very impressive with the 8%. And uh, so these are interesting but typical numbers. Um, so hopefully we can move everybody along and there's a takeaway um, that you can take back to your organization. Okay, we ready to move along? You betcha. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is build your business case. Okay, because when you go to your approving officials, they're going to say, prove it to me. At least that's been my experience. What's in it for us as an organization? And there's a lot of research out there, you know, uh, and I won't repeat what's on the screen, but just say that uh, um, Rand and Hall Group released a study showing that 50% of organizations are short on leadership skills in their current environment. 71% reported that their leaders are not ready to lead their organizations into the future. Well, we're not going backwards, we're going forward. So 71% is a staggering number, okay? Um, so how does this happen? Well, part of the bottom line in terms of profit or goal attainment for your organization is to have a workforce that's ready. And that's not only the employees, but including leaders ready to perform for today and anticipating tomorrow. So uh, again, think about, whoop, I don't know what's happening with my mouse here. There you here. go, go yeah. to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of the things that I think is really interesting, um, one of the reasons that we are showing some of these statistics that many of you on the call will already be familiar with is because these are also the same statistics that will support you in building your business case. Um, I think that uh, there's so much research out there that is alarming and the organizations that are in the 8 to 10 percent that have effective leadership pipeline strategies are using this data to support not decreasing but increasing their learning and development and leadership readiness programs. Um, so go ahead, Renee. Yeah, so a really, really good point. So some of the work is really done for you right here in starting your, uh, your research and having some data. So we know that 87% of millennials say professional development or career growth opportunities are very important. The millennials that I've worked in in the past, you know, day one is, uh, thank you very much, where's the computer, and then how do I get my, uh, my next promotion? So, um, so we really have to pay attention to who they are and what they need to be successful in an organization. Because dissatisfaction with some employee development efforts appear to fuel many early exits. We asked uh, young managers what their employers do to help them grow in their jobs and what they'd like their employers to do and found some really large gaps. Workers have reported that companies generally satisfy their needs for on-the-job development and that, their value, that they value these orgs. Um, opportunities which include high visibility positions and significant increases in responsibility but they're not getting much in the way of formal development such as training mentoring and coaching all things that they value very very much again you know, Renee, I want to share a real quick story um, and this is uh, interesting because it's it's not a singular story but it is what we're seeing a lot of we're working with a lot of uh, organizations and coaching some of their hypos um, that are in the millennial um, generation and some of the challenges that we're facing specifically for Millennials is they bump up into um, a, sort of a career 
what's it called, a career plateau, and they exactly. want the next promotion, um, and they feel that they've put in their time, and when an organization has not had an effective performance management process, what is happening is those managers of these millennials are saying, but wait a second, you're not performing at the level you need to to get to the next level, and many of the millennials are, millennials are completely blindsided by that information. Um, and, and this is uh, this is what we're seeing time and time and time again. By the time we get to support them, they are uh, disenfranchised with their organization because this is information they say they should have had sooner if it was real. If it was real that they didn't have leadership capacity, the organization should have told this sooner so they had the chance to develop it. And by the time they get to us, sometimes they're ready to jump ship. Um, and that's I'm seeing that consistently. But the companies don't want to lose them. They consider them high value and, and important contributors. But by the time they get to developing them or offering them something for, for career development, the hypos are, are disenfranchised. Good, good point. Also to, to know that millennials are getting to be very savvy when they are switching jobs and that they're asking the questions about career advancement, career development. Um, they want um, all the opportunities they can to advance their skills. They don't want to plateau. So um, think of it also as a, a, as a recruitment tool that you could say we have in place these development programs. You know, and it doesn't have to start off as, you know, all that elaborate to create um, job satisfaction. Start with an internal mentoring program can be a very in, um, inexpensive direct cost initiative. You know, the indirect course, cost, of course, is um, the course development for mentors and mentees. But the matching process can be very simple or more robust. Your organization gets to decide based on your recommendations. So, again, we know that 44% of Gen Xers and 41% of baby boomers say opportunities to learn and grow are extremely important, as I've said before, when applying for a, for a job. So, basically, it's the same thing for all generations. Everyone just about wants to learn and grow. And as I said, this is quite the incentive for recruiting. So if you're recruiting for above um, a, a first line supervisor, say for a mid-level or a, a, a senior level, they want to know what are you going to do for them in terms of solidifying um, their development, giving them opportunity to um, learn some new competencies when it comes to the latest trends in uh, workforce development development. So it's something to pay attention to that it's not just the general workforce staff that needs to be developed and nurtured, but your leaders need to be taken care of also. Okay, so basically when you're building your business case, um, you, uh, you want to make sure that you don't look back but be future oriented. You know, be that change agent, be that person who is going to help your senior leaders make the, make the move forward. Um, do, you have, um, do you have what you need to align your business strategy with your uh, organizational strategic plan? Um, senior leaders love to hear that HR knows what uh, the organizational strategic plan is and how this particular sh business strategy of developing leaders will affect the bottom line. So if you don't have a business case, now's the time to build one. Like I said, don't look back. Um, identify weak links and career paths that present the greatest organizational risks. So is it your first line supervisors? You're having trouble getting those high potential employees into first line? Or is it moving uh, leaders up in your, into your organization? Where's that weak link that uh, you can build your business case around? So create 
a picture in your mind and a picture for your senior leader that aligns this business and cultural challenges leaders are likely to face in the organization at each transition point. If you're familiar with creating a mind map where you actually can draw a picture that shows all the linkages, so much the better. Um, if not, try Googling uh, how to create a mind map. It's a nice uh, graphic tool to uh, make your cases. So for the rest of today, why you know, we've been talking that you can really uh, need to develop leaders at all levels. We're just going to use, for example, of how to develop first line leaders. However, as I said before, all your weak points are, um, in your leadership pipeline should be identified. So you make your case, um, and I love this quote so much from um, Tom Peters, leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. And I think that is such a powerful, powerful message. HR must be a strong leader as seen as a strategic partner. Anissa, do you want to say something? No, I, oh. I think that that's the piece that we're finding most relevant mm -hmm. for our clients is that um, building your case and then making your case requires HR to oftentimes step up in ways that um, sometimes are uncomfortable with some of our HR leaders because they mm -hmm. are viewed as, um, they view themselves sometimes as more operational than strategic. And in order to ensure, uh, we, we call it that HR seat at the table, this is one of the ways in which HR can really impact uh, the strategic goals and and these the first two strategic decisions the one of the reasons why we are drilling down on those so critically is because it's the piece of the puzzle that so many of our uh, HR leaders leave out they know what needs to be done they assume others know it so instead of building the case and demonstrating that they understand the strategic priorities and this in fact is one of the strategic priorities that is uh, going to be responsible for fulfilling those strategic goals and they skip right to the next one which is who we want to develop and how much we want to spend on it and and so that's the only thing I wanted to say about that is that strategic business leadership requires HR to make the case to convince others of the necessity absolutely um, when I was working um, for a, a government agency I came in as their first person in their training organization that actually had a human resource background, a training and development background. Before that, it had always been um, a technical leader. So um, obviously their uh, bent for education was on technology. So when I would become, I went before the uh, senior leaders in the organization at, with an HR perspective of what we needed to do, not only to develop workforce, I mean technical competencies, but what was our chain for leadership development, etc. They looked at me like I had two heads at first, um, but they eventually got used to me and started seeing me as a strategic partner in the company. So, you know, you want to think of companies that are stuck in the traditional view, as Anissa said, that the sole purpose of business is to, to make money at whatever cost. They'll push their HR to be operational and ultimately less competitive. When they focus in on maximizing short-term profits and pleasing shareholders today, you know, the future is the price that will be paid. This can be expressed in financial terms, but remember that an effective HR leader knows their numbers and makes the case for acting with strategic foresight now. And I can't stress that enough. Know your numbers. Who's in the workforce? Who's in the pipeline? Who's retirement eligible? Uh, um, knowing, uh, knowing all that data is a really good source of information for any HR person. So HR really can make the case that building an enduring organization requires this pipeline of competent leaders. HR leaders want to coach their executives, and frankly, inspire their executive peers into envisioning more than just financial returns. They want to also leave a legacy of an enduring institution. HR can coax their peers into realizing they will be seen as a leader that left their organization prepared for the future or weak, unprepared, 
and ill-equipped to survive. So the choice is theirs, and your goal is to, of course, help them want to leave an enduring legacy. You know, there's all kinds of data from a globalization perspective, you know, about uh, innovation and social values and cultural awareness. So you, you really want to think about um, what affects the culture of your organization. Okay. And don't forget as we move along, if you've got some questions and this is ready to take some of them. So. We're still on the business case in the sense of you want to tell your story. You need to build consensus within your organization. So we said focus on the business, demonstrate long-term commitment as a strategic partner. And so HR is more than just the operational staff that people sometimes will call it, that you're the partner in meeting the needs both strategic and tactically within the organization. And then I don't know about you, but my experience has always been, well, HR is just putting out another flavor of the month or initiative of the month. Um, but you really have to hold fast and show a long-term commitment to be a valuable strategic partner. That means you have to keep talking. Someone will eventually listen. Keep talking about what the organization means. Change can be hard for people, but if you sometimes have to take baby steps, coach them along, ask them some interesting questions, find a way to show how you can customize and grow your ideas incrementally, which is another way. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. So every organization you know, needs some kind of succession plan. The questions they must answer is very simple. How many leaders do we need and at what levels? Is it entry, intermediate, senior? Is there a gap in our current internal pipeline uh, with our future needs? How are we going to fill that gap? Some human resource directors, in my experience, have been told that a strategy for leadership development is not necessary. They're not hiring or promoting, so why invest in the foreseeable future? Well, for me, um, um, that's a bit short-sighted. You need to know your long-term projections. How else can you prepare for the future? Keep your leadership pipeline fresh. You must have programs that were designed uh, well and that meet the needs of your organization. There's lots of best practices out there, but if you really pay attention um, to what's happening in your organization, you can tell your story. You can relate to what's happening specifically within your organization and how some long-term forecasting and projection planning and implementation, um, you can have a wonderful story to tell. So what will it cost us? Well, of course, everybody is going to ask that one. Um, they always want to know, what's it going to cost us? Secondly, they'll ask, how is it going to help us meet our strategic goals? Well, your job is to be ready to answer those questions. You can obviously tell them when they ask you how much it's going to cost, it depends. And uh, I've tried that approach and you always get this worried look on their face. So let's try a more um, proactive approach. The budget for your, say, a leadership readiness program, that's moving your high potential, say, into a first-line leadership program, or it could be transitioning leaders from one level to another, is completely within your control or the control of the organization. You can start with a small cadre of participants, a small offering of classes, and build incrementally towards a best practice program. The dollar range on training investment for leaders is vast. Um, so your research could be from zero to who knows whatever. You know, I've seen some uh, averages that say some may spend only um, $1,800 per person annually, and others thousands more. When I built a leadership readiness program for a government agency, they spent about $200,000 for 25 students. Now, initially you say, that's ridiculous, or how are we ever going to find $200,000? And even to them, it sounded ridiculously high. 
However, when we broke it down, it was $8,000 per participant, inclusive of all the training, using internal and external facilitators, mentors, classroom space, assessment tools, etc. Now, here's the real, real point to make that $8,000, huh, that still seems high. However, for HR to hire a new millennial, the average in the recruitment and onboarding process is $24,000. So suddenly $8,000 a person from a $200,000 investment for this agency did not seem so terrible. So again, know your numbers. Think about what's the cost that it would be. Think about the lowest common denominator way that you can break it down so you don't shock them. Um, but ha have your facts together. So let's now look at, uh, 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 oh, in step six, I should okay. say. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was, was going to say that very thing. In step six, yeah. um, we're going to get to tracking progress and ROI and, and how to make a, uh, the case for ongoing development. And um, I just wanted to point out, uh, Renee, we're about 30 minutes in and we've got five more points to get through. So okay. um, I, will I think speed part it of that has been our technological challenges, but we'll, we'll definitely speed through this next poll and okay. make sure that we're able to deliver on our promise today. Absolutely, absolutely. So why don't you just go into that next poll and we'll do it really quick. Okay. That sounds like a good plan. So we want to hear from you guys. Um, and I have a typo here. It should say, um, uh, what does your organization, wait, did I do that? What does, what does your, your, well, maybe not. What does your organization spend per individual per year on leadership development? Um, is your organization spending greater than 5000 per person? Are they spending 1000 to 5000 per person? Are they spending less than 1000 per person? Or is it the bare minimum only when we really, really need to, um, or other? Tell us what you're spending. I certainly, we certainly worked with organizations um, who have a very specific budget, and, and that's what they do every year. And then other organizations um, who one year are spending um, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a person, and then the next year they they spend less. So we'd love to hear. Um, so it looks like we're we still have a few people taking the poll now. Um, it looks like we're settling in. Um, mm -hmm. to about 40% are spending about $1,000 uh, per person, uh, and then 40% uh, are spending the, the bare minimum. We have about 21% uh, of those folks that are on the call that are spending anywhere between 1000 and 5000 Looks like we're slowing down, so I'm going to mm -hmm. go ahead and close our poll. Please do. And then I'm going to share our results. There we go. So hopefully, again, uh, takeaways from today will be those of you at the bare minimum, less than a thousand or whatever, that there's something that you can see that you can incrementally add to your programs that can contribute to your leadership development. So yeah, let's just pull. There you go. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. So we want to start with. You've, you've just been given the approval to develop your first line leadership readiness program. Imagine it, it will happen. Now what do I do? So first thing I like to do is to prepare my list. What do I know? What don't I know? This can go on and on, but it just seems to clear my brain of what, what we have, what we don't have, etc. So you want to think of this holistically. Everything has to come together to launch an effective program. You need to understand what leadership development is and is not, the importance of leadership development in your organization, the direct and indirect cost. And so there are many ways to develop and measure leaders as we're going to talk about. But eligibility, communication, the components, the budget are all important things. Take each one of those, break them down, and you will be able to, um, again, have more things to contribute to that final one-page summary that we talked about initially. Okay, do we want to take this other quick poll? Yeah, why don't we do that real quick, and then I'd like for you to talk about um, uh, competencies that you've seen uh, okay. that organizations 
um, find to be the most important. I mean, there are uh, 70 plus competencies, depending on what resource uh, we read. Um, so folks on the call, let us know, what do you feel like in your organization would be the most important competency for your first level leaders to master? And Renee, what have you found to be true in the multi-tiered leadership development programs? In terms of competency, um, the the competencies do change a little bit because you move from being a manager, you know, the first line leaders are often called managers where there's direct supervision of the workforce and moving up into more leadership responsibilities. So again, you're letting go of more of the tactical responsibilities of taking care of the organization into the strategic. So a first line, uh, a manager leader may be looking at things like performance management, um, coaching, communication, um, even their own time management kinds of things. And then as you're moving up, it may be into um, political savvy how to navigate the organization internally, and then as you're at the senior level, maybe there's an external component to that. Um, it could be, again, more emphasis on the strategic planning side. So did I answer your question? You did, you did, and I think that's exactly what we found as well. So mm -hmm. uh, really interesting. For first level leaders, you guys um, felt like effective communication. Absolutely. 68% was the most important, followed by developing staff, uh, followed by problem solving. I find this um, to be super uh, curious regarding conflict management. We get a lot of, of more calls for uh, effective communication, which in turn, of course, will support people in having better conflict management, conflict resolution skills. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and I'll just say effective communication is such a broad topic that it can cover so much that we'll save that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Okay. okay. So let's really get into the, the meat, the guts of things, and talk about eligibility and, and selection. Who will be part of your first leadership readiness program? You have to think about things. Um, do you have the ability to handpick them? Uh, do you want or need a competitive process? Many organizations will use this competitive process to ensure that employees view this as an equal opportunity for all. Uh, perhaps you have something already built into a succession planning model that puts them into this type of program. Do you have to have uh, somebody who's applying for your program or uh, have managerial approval? Some say yes, some say no. What if the manager doesn't approve? What happens? You as the HR person who's building this program has to be ready with the policies and procedures. Selection criteria. Is it going to be, if you're a government agency, a grade level, or is there a certain salary threshold that you have to get to? Perhaps it's the length of employment. Maybe you don't want somebody who's been in there um, th in the organization three months, or maybe you don't want somebody who's been in here for five years and hasn't decided to do anything about their development. Maybe you want to target specific positions. Maybe there's certain educational requirements. All important things to think through before you announce your job. Then how are you going to announce it in terms of what forms you're going to use? What's your timeline for the application process? How are you going to market your program? And this, I can't stress enough, is the marketing. How will you hold briefings for interested people? How will you make sure you've anticipated the questions that uh, people may have? They're going to look at the HR people, the program designers, to have answers for them. And the more confidently you can answer these questions, um, it shows them how much or demonstrates confidence in the program itself. And of course, then there is the selection process. Who's going to be involved in this decision making? Uh, who I often will recommend, and I, 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 I think it really works, is to form some kind of leadership advisory council. This is where you can have leaders from different parts of the organization come together, again, to demonstrate not only diversity uh, and fairness 
and sort of a organizational-wide examination of who some of the future leaders may be. Um, anticipate what kind of questioning, but again, all of these things can be broken down into more detail of questions that you need to anticipate. So who will participate in your leadership development program? Again, here's a, another example of what I was just saying before. Um, uh, some of the tools could be the nine box. It could be based on performance evaluations. You may need uh, some kind of letter or written justification from the, from, from the manager. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that we need to do to participate in the leadership program. So what? What components will deliver results that will align with your goals, budget, and culture? So here are some of the components. Primary methods of developing leaders. There's so much going on today in how to develop. Instructor-led training. There's still the classroom-led. And I, uh, I, some people may say that they, that they don't, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, they, don't, they don't do much of that anymore. I find that with leadership development, there's so much richness and bringing people together and talking together uh, on case studies, et cetera. Can it be done over the web? Of course it can. Um, but uh, don't forget, if, if there is a common location for your leaders, try and bring them together. If nothing else, the networking. You'd be surprised how people from different parts of the organization don't always know each other. One-on-one -on -one coaching is another really, really good way of developing uh, leaders. I often say, how do you develop leaders to get out of their own way? What's stopping them? Why does that thing keep going back and forth like that? I actually uh -huh. launched the poll while you were talking. Oh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. No, no worries. You were, you were on a roll and it's all good stuff. So okay. um, I, we wanted to just ask folks, what do you typically use? And so mm -hmm. right now, Thank um, you. Uh, the answer is, what, what was your company's primary method of developing gotcha. leaders? And those on our webinar said primary approach is instructor-led training, um, with the secondary approach being managers are responsible for developing their people. And so I, I find that to be pretty typical. Um, certainly, instructor-led training has its place, and we're finding that um, that's traditionally the easiest methodology, right? We, mm -hmm. we, we see we have a gap. Our folks need to learn project management. Our folks need to learn effective communication. And they will uh, conduct a training. Um, or they will say, OK, you guys need to make sure your people are developed. Um, and, and so I think that these components are really important that you're going to share with us. I'm going to hide this poll. Um, and then the slide that shares, there we go. Go to the next hang, slide. Oh, if you would. Hang, hang on one sec. I, yep. I was intrigued with 45% uh, managers are responsible for developing their people. This is a really interesting statistic because we put that responsibility on our managers, but we often don't give them the tools to use. So, and they're so busy that it often gets pushed to the wayside. We don't teach them how to develop their employees, plus we don't give them the tools. Um, so imagine if you focused on what you can do to help your existing managers develop their uh, uh, employees into future leaders. Okay, really so good let me point. move it along. Okay, so components to consider, you know, um, I, I love this part where it says effective leaders develop uh, th in three key areas. They have to be able to lead themselves. That's everything from their, from their time management, how they manage their own uh, conflict management, their communication skills, um, uh, really understanding emotional intelligence, uh, so there's so much that can be done there. Then in having to lead others, as I just said before, about managing the development of others, giving them performance feedback, uh, helping to coach them to become more technically savvy, if that's the case. And of course, leading in business, problem solving, goal attainment are important things that you need to do. So how do you bring this all together? Um, 
You can, you know, do you have specific knowledge, skills, and abilities for leaders at your organization in, in different levels? Maybe you have a competency, uh, leadership competency strategy that already delineates what a first-line manager leader needs to know versus what an intermediate or senior level. Great job if you have that. It's a great place to get started. If not, how will you know where really to focus your program? Well, you can develop um, competencies via a partnership between HR and the existing leadership. Obviously, you can hire an external consultant to partner with on the development, or you can even research off-the-shelf competencies, but you want to find the right fit for your organization. What I love about developing leadership to development programs is um, you want to incorporate not only classroom training and book knowledge um, is real world experience. This really brings home all of the classroom learning. It brings home um, what individuals in the organization can share with each other. Um, they need to gain knowledge from people in the organization who serve in leadership. Um, you can do that so, um, so easily with mentoring programs. Uh, good, remember, coaches ask good questions to help people figure out the answers, and mentors share their experience. They can do that by asking good questions also, but it's really about giving back what they have learned, um, the hard knocks maybe they've been through, uh, and help guide people on, on their way. And then you want to give future leaders an opportunity to practice and learn, to try out the new skills that they're learning, you know, even like short-term assignments. And then the final part that I, the organization, especially the senior leaders love, is putting it all together. And we often, you'll hear it called a capstone program. And this is where they pay back to the organization for the time and money spent in developing leaders in the organization. You know, it, it could be a real important uh, goal or organizational issue, and members of your leadership development program actually work on these. Sometimes they use their mentors as um, resources, and they present back to the organization real solutions and ways to implement uh, a real problem in the organization. So it really I, gets them to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna add to that very quick. Um, there are really effective programs out there for, for teaching people how to lead themselves and leading others, understanding mm -hmm. that piece of it. One of the most difficult things in business, for, and, and there's a significant gap, is, is uh, training our leaders to understand business, business acumen, critical thinking, um, because most of our training methodologies outside of capstone uh, projects um, are considered, um, let me give you the information, now go do it. And the ability to think strategically, the ability to understand strategic agility or mm -hmm. risk analysis or even financial acumen or business acumen mm -hmm. requires they get their hands in the mix. They need to put their hands in the clay and to formulate something to really gain those business acumen skills. Capstone projects and, and Shark Tank uh, competitions mm -hmm. and simulations and gamification are the most effective way to move the needle on that that we have found. Absolutely. And I'll also stress group coaching, bringing together groups of people that work on real life case studies uh, in their organization. Um, they not only get to help each other, coach each other, but they also get to practice um, leading a group. They get to practice coaching each other and help to get some resolution. It's the same thing as, and I'll just say the peer teaching, having the power of learning something in depthly to be able to teach your colleagues is, uh, is quite an important component also. So there's lots of creativity that can be done with this. And this is just a, a, probably a familiar slide to lots of you in HR um, about uh, uh, reten retention. And it doesn't mean that lectures, reading, and audio visuals do not have their place, but that practicing by doing and teaching others are really where the learning is solidified. Okay, and moving on. So, 
there are 87 percent of the skills brought about by a training program is lost without follow-up coaching and my experience in working with with clients uh in a coaching environment they will support that wholeheartedly uh, i ask them when was the last time they took the book or the training materials off the shelf almost never well let's pull it out what questions how does it help you make you become a real leader how do you apply it um, what more do you need to do um, to, pra to practice those skills so there's all kinds of studies that are out there um, if you're in sales the uh, one study is that 87 percent of sales training content is lost after 30 days and this whole study involved um, um, bringing in uh, coaches or having the managers coach their employees and they found such an increase in sales effectiveness that they eventually went um, from 16th place out of 17th in their organization to, num to number one. So there's lots of data on how to reinforce learning through coaching. Again, individual one-on-one, -on -one, there's um, group, and there's even team coaching to think about where a leader brings in their whole team and they work, they work through issues. So here's, here's an important one about uh, track, tracking results. Marshall Goldsmith, a best-selling author, and his partner Howard Morgan had completed extensive research study of over six, 80, excuse me, 86,000 respondents in eight major corporations on the impact of leadership development. Their findings, I found, were very compelling, yet not very surprising. Managers that involve their people back on the job and actually apply the concepts they were taught were seen as becoming far more effective leaders, not by themselves, but by their co-workers. Managers who didn't apply what was learned didn't get any better. So really working with your employees, uh, maybe applying a little bit of situational leadership when you have new employees, what kinds of ways do you coach them versus somebody who might have some more experience, how you might do that differently. So I, I love this. We says when people add know a, one little, I want to add just a real quick note on that. Um, the, the key there was that the corporations, the companies and organizations that um, tallied other people's opinions regarding how their managers were involved were the ones that moved the needle. Um, it, and, and it was the act of measuring those performance indicators. It was the act of asking others, uh, these are the specific uh, competencies that these managers have uh, been charged with developing. How did they do? That act alone improved the manager's um, uh, ability to retain the learning and apply it to their team. And it also, ironically, but not so ironically, improved the perception of those around. So it wasn't so much that the others didn't do the work, it's that just the act of asking others, how did we do, was sufficient enough to move the needle. And that's where the key is. Wonderful, thanks for explaining that. Which leads us to, and I'm really worried about time, so I'm trying to go really quickly. You're doing is, fantastic. Oh, thanks. Is about, so how do they know that the money is well spent? Senior leaders will ask you that every time. And when there's a money crunch, they're going to ask, how do we know? How do we know? They, you know, there's always the, the simple, uh, the simple level one evaluations. Some people call them the smile factor ones. And that's when you're evaluating an individual event or course. Um, but not the whole program. Um, do you even know what the indicators of success would be? This is a really important question to ask the organization, but to ask them up front before you start the program. What will success look like? Will it be having more filled positions? Will it be having better overall organizational scores on performance feedback, uh, customer improvement? Um, so there's so many different questions you want to ask and find how do they measure success. So I have a good friend, uh, her name is Marsha Monshine, and she wrote a book called Measure It. And it's all about collaborative tracking. 
She defines this as a, an accountability tool um, that she put into a training process to improve training's impact and cost effectiveness. Uh, so I thought that was really good. Uh, of course, here's a little quote from uh, um, our good friend Albert Einstein. We're going to move along. Um, so her her overall premise for her for her book, um, and each of the of these things go into such huge detail that we won't have time for today. But again, describe the business issue or need, conduct your cost justification. You have to develop a tracking system. Will you be measuring each class? Have an average score? Uh, will it be around attendance? How is it fitting into the overall program? Commit to action. Specify specific actions that need to accomplish the desired training outcomes. Agree on individual responsibilities and implement tracking and training process. You want to track the impact of it all. Um, you want to give, um, uh, present results and recommendations. This is another thing. Don't be silent for however long your program lasts. You know, you want to keep marketing it. You want to keep talking about it. You want to keep reporting it. That's why, as I mentioned before, having a leadership advisory council um, let them have roles in it. Get people involved in talking um, about it. I, I used this process when I was creating uh, a program for one division in an organization. They wanted a leadership readiness program. We started it, but we kept marketing it in, in terms of sharing what was going on in, the, uh, in this particular division. And by halfway through, the rest of the organization is saying, we want in. What do we have to do? We think we, you know, we have leaders, uh, potential leaders that want to be developed. Include us next time. There is almost like an enviable, wow, you're in that division, you get developed kind of a thing. So really talk about your program and get and give a lots of feedback. Um, so success in management requires learning as fast as the world is changing. Warren Bennis couldn't be more correct and our world is changing, changing, changing. And you know you have to aim small but you know think big. Um, don't wait for perfection. Don't wait for complete uh, um, uh, course development. You're, you know, you really want to roll up your sleeve and say, "This is what we have. It's a place to start. If you need to call it a pilot, call it a pilot." Um, because um, it's more like planting seeds in your organization for for future growth. This is a place for us to start. You know, so really work on that. Um, and, and, and like I said, incremental is perfectly fine. Start today with a simple program of coaching or mentoring or um, bringing them together to develop a particular competency in your organization. But having a full diversified program that meets the learning needs for people in different ways. Again, the in instructor-led will appeal to some learners um, that are, you know, perhaps very auditory. Um, it could be, um, you know, the real the capstone program is very kinesthetic. It's very hands-on, and some people learn best that way. So think about the different learning needs of your community as you're designing. Um, refine get feedback, reflect some more, and create. The thing is, keep moving forward. So we did a really, really fast view, again, of this, my favorite screen. Uh, if you can answer these questions, this, this is what the program is. Uh, you would have a complete program here. Uh, let's see. So, Anissa, you want to talk oh, about the fast pass? You. Yeah, I'm. Uh, we really jam packed today, so thank yes. you everyone for being here. One of the things that we want to make sure that we offer to you on the call is support in moving your leadership development goals to the next level. So we invite you to take advantage of what we call our fast path strategy session. Renee or I 
um, will get together with you and identify, help you identify the top three priorities that are important to you regarding leadership development and your organization. Two, we're going to talk about the top three challenges that you'll need to overcome. Sometimes that's about making your case, and sometimes it's about um, maximizing your budget or um, learning from past uh, organizational development programs that may or may not have been effective. Uh, and then finally, we're going to develop, help you develop a three-part actionable strategy for next, step, uh, next steps. This is our way of giving back. Um, there's no charge for that. If that is something you feel like would be um, supportive in your goals, um, I, we invite you to give us a call or shoot us an email, or if you can see on your screen, there is a link there um, that you can just grab an appointment with us and we can help you on that. So um, one of the things, too, that we want to make sure we provide to you guys as an option uh, is that Renee is actually uh, thinking about putting together a small group uh, coaching program specifically dedicated to helping HR folks design their program. Um, if that is something that you would be interested in, we'd love to get your feedback in order to design that and roll that out probably in the next few months. So thank you, everyone, for being here. If you have questions and we did not get to that, um, do submit your questions to us via email. Watch for an email. I know that quite a few of you have asked, will the slides be available? Will the recording be available? And absolutely, we will make sure that you get that. Um, and we look forward to brainstorming and working with you guys. Renee, thank you so much, so much information today, and, and I know that there was um, actionable options for folks <laughs> on the call, so thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, good luck to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic